Greetings dear friends this is your personal English coach professor DC In this video we are going to understand a beautiful sonnet written by William Wordsworth This is called the world is too much with us On my screen you can see the original poem and you can observe two important things here One is the line numbers that I have given to each line and secondly the meanings of the difficult words beside the word itself in blue Both of these things will help you and me understand the sonnet very clearly. Now, without a further ado, let's talk about the agenda of this video. In the coming few minutes, we are going to talk about six main things, and I promise you by the end of this video, you will have no doubts left. We'll start off talking about the poet himself, William Wordsworth. Secondly, every poet writes something for a reason we will talk about that we will talk about why was this poem written at the first place third is the poem structure how did william wordsworth decide to organize this poem fourth is the meaning of the title itself sometimes if you understand the title and its deeper meaning you know half of the poem already fifth topic is the line by line actual explanation which is where you are interested in and finally the summary so after i give the summary i promise you will not have to revise the poem again so why don't we talk a little bit about the poet before getting into the details friends let us quickly talk about the poet because this is a big name William Wordsworth was born on 7th of April 1770. This is a long long time back at a place called Cockermouth in Cumbria. His father was a lawyer. Both Wordsworth's parents died before he was just 15 years old. And he and his four siblings were left in the care of different people, different relatives. Now as a young man, Wordsworth developed a love of nature. and you can clearly see that in many of his other poems he died on 23rd april 1850 and he was well known to be a english romantic poet have you heard of another poet known by the name samuel taylor coleridge so samuel taylor coleridge and william wordsworth they paired up to launch a publication called lyrical ballads and this was published in 1798 isn't it interesting this became one of the very well known english literature romantic works now let's talk about why did william wordsworth think of writing this poem because if you understand this part your interest to understand and learn this poem even deepens more So now I want you to turn on your imaginations imagine that you are living in the midst of nature you are living just beside a lake you are living near a water body with pure water constantly flowing your house is surrounded by a lot of green trees big enough to provide you shelter and you are living at a place where you're feeling a deep natural connection so as i stated earlier william wordsworth also was living and was born in a place called lake district on my screen you can see something called lake district which is uh, windermere currently and this is where he was brought up and um like many other romantic writers he saw in nature an emblem of god or the divine and his poetry often celebrates the beauty and spiritual values of the natural world now wordsworth has penned many many sonnets in the early 19th century criticizing what he saw was modernization 
I'm sure there's a question in your mind as to what is a sonnet. We will be talking about that in just few minutes. But just keep in mind that William Wordsworth wrote numerous sonnets. He was criticizing the industrial revolution, industrial modernization that was happening elsewhere in his country. So on one side, he was deeply connected to nature and on the other side, people were destroying nature to bring in the industrial revolution. And because of the industrial revolution, people had started getting into something called rat race where they would wake up, go to the jobs, come back and sleep. They would never spare time for nature and Wordsworth felt that people are being disconnected from nature. This is why he has written the poem called The World is too much with us right so as I said earlier Wordsworth had written numerous sonnets in the early 19th century criticizing modernization now this poem here is one of them it represents his belief that in order to advance spirituality mankind must be connected with nature the world might relate to natural world rather than the city implying that mankind is so busy that they don't have time for natural world because it's too much. Wordsworth emphasizes the relevance of nature to an individual's intellectual and spiritual growth on several occasions. A positive relationship with nature allows people to connect to both the spiritual and social realms. As Wordsworth argues in the prelude, a love of nature may be transformative. A love of nature, as Wordsworth describes in the prelude, can lead to the love of humanity. So the reason is pretty clear. His observation is people are getting disconnected from nature and what Wordsworth believes is if people are disconnected with nature, how will they love mankind? And going by this observation, he has written this particular sonnet called The World is Too Much With Us. Now friends, let's quickly talk about how this poem is organized or structured. So I have been telling you that this is not a poem but a sonnet. But what is a sonnet? Sonnet is nothing but a song. In this world, Whichever songs you've heard so far represents a feeling. Would you agree? If you are sad, there are songs for it. If you are happy, there are songs for it. Similarly, William Wordsworth also has a feeling which he has converted into a sonnet. Now, if you read Shakespeare's works, you would see a lot of sonnets being used here and there. And normally, the way these sonnets are structured is there will be eight lines in the beginning and six lines in the end. Normally the eight lines would have some questions and the succeeding lines would have answers but this is not the case with this poem. Uh, if we talk about the rhyming scheme of this sonnet it is let's let's try to figure out so we have soon powers hours and boon which means looks like this is a B B A so this is about the first four lines what about the next four lines we have moon hours flowers tune okay again it looks like it is A B B A so from line number one to eight the rhyming scheme is A B B A A B B A next if you see the last set of lines right from 9 to 14 let's read out the last words be outworn lee forlorn see horn so looks like the last six lines have the rhyming scheme of cd 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 so as i said if you go back to the early literature usually you will see sonnets everywhere which are composed of eight lines which are called octaves and uh, there would be two rhymes a b b a a b b a and a group of six lines which is called sestet 
with two or three rhymes who variously arranged typically C D E C D E or C D C D C D. The the toughest or theme is stated and developed. Alright, let us begin with line number one. Poet says the world is too much with us late and soon. Think about it biologically. Initially, the world came into existence, which primarily consisted of nature. Then came the evolution of creatures and finally us. In a broader sense, the poet says that although we have been created by nature and brought to this world, it has become too much for the nature itself to bear us now because of our actions. Well, this is the central idea of the poem. Or we can say sonnet. People no longer care enough about the natural environment because they are too preoccupied with worldly material things. People are not adequately aware of nature as a whole because they are too connected to worldly petty things. People don't have time to enjoy nature's beauty or to spend quality time in it. Today's man considers time spent in nature to be a waste of time when they could be working to support their worldly wants. Now friends, late and soon is a strange phrase here. So if we rephrase the first line, we could have said, the world is too much with us lately. Or we could also have said, the world will be too much with us very soon. So it could mean sooner or later, or it could mean we have done this recently or in the past and we will do it in the future as well. Late and soon means in the past and in the future, so actually all the time. Let's check out line number two. The poet says, getting and spending we lay waste our powers. There is no end to human conveniences. The more we have, the more we want. We get something to eliminate a small discomfort and pretty soon that new gadget, that new arrangement also becomes trivial. Now we are looking for something bigger and better. Well, that too doesn't serve us for a prolonged time. Wordsworth observed all this very minutely and then he states, we lay waste our powers. Now friends, imagine what you and I can do. Imagine what humans can do in favor of nature. Through intelligence, humans possess cognitive abilities. To learn, we can form concepts, we can understand things, we can apply logic, we can reason things out including the capacity to recognize patterns. We can plan, we can innovate, we can solve problems, problems like climate crisis. We can make decisions, we can retain information, we can use language to communicate with each other for the betterment of nature. I think we are one of the most sophisticated beings on earth. Yet, it has gone to a waste according to the poet. Why? Because he feels that the foundational element in human plan of action is missing which is connected with nature to be connected with nature and doing things in favor of nature being one with nature people are so preoccupied with getting and spending that they are unaware of their own potential beyond what they have tapped into humans waste their power living in this materialistic world because they are too busy working and spending money. Now, you must have observed already that the poem, this poem, uh, poem or sonnet, it begins with a complaint, lamenting the state of world and the self-destruction caused by consumerism. So Wordsworth expresses his dissatisfaction with the state of the world and how inadequately people regard nature and its surroundings. Line number three, little we see in nature that is ours. As I stated earlier, we are a speck of nature itself. The human body is approximately 99% comprised of just six elements, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, calcium, phosphorus. When we see ourselves as a part of nature, we are fundamentally connected to nature. We don't see ourselves as separate, rather as another species in larger ecosystem of the natural world. Nature isn't an other, rather it is a part of us and we are a part of nature. Man thinks that spending time in nature is not as beneficial 
as spending time and money to satisfy our materialistic needs. Wordsworth emphasizes the value of nature to a person's intellectual and spiritual growth time and time again. A positive relationship with nature fosters a person's connection to the social and spiritual realms. A love of nature can lead to love of people eventually, as Wordsworth writes in The Prelude. Now, line number four. Friends, it is important that you keep remembering the meanings of the words because if you understand the meanings, you understand the line and the idea itself. Okay, line number four says, We have given our hearts away a sordid boon. Let's rephrase this statement. I can say we have given a sordid boon to our hearts. Let's make it even simpler. We have handed over our hearts to a shameful thing. I'm sure you must have understood it a little bit already. Here, given our hearts means given our precious energy, time, attention, and hence our life to something that is shameful. Not only that, man considers those actions as blessings. So we keep doing something that is not in tune with nature, but we also firmly believe that it's a blessing. The phase, sordid boon, presents a paradox because the word sordid designates a conduct that is immoral and dishonorable, yet the word boon designates a positive outcome. Nature and the world are contrasted by the speaker. He makes clear that despite the time people spend pursuing material items, the true beauty of nature cannot be experienced by that. A boon is a prize, an advantage or anything for which one should be grateful. The word sordid is an adjective that denotes base or vile. The speaker is being sarcastic here. Sordid often refers to a degrading quality. Wordsworth refers to the loss of harmony with nature as a sordid boon to indicate that it has gotten worse as human needs for material goods have grown. Line number five. The sea that bears her bosom to the moon. Actually, it is this sea that bears her bosom to the moon. So the poet is trying to show something to maybe humans. He says, this sea that bears the bosom to the moon. What is the meaning of this line? Now, friends, here comes the usage of a lot of personifications as a method to combine human sentiments with aspects of natural world in order to emphasize the ideal relationship between a man and earth that speaker wishes for in a damaged society that he is observing. Now, this is a simple line if you know the meaning of two words here. Bear and bosom. You must have heard this word bear a couple of times. Bear is to be without clothes or naked. Remember we keep using this phrase bare hands, barefooted. That's the same thing here. So half of the sentence should already be clear by now. The sentence is the sea that bears. Sea bears her bosom to the moon. So the sea is uncovered. What has she uncovered? Her bosom means her chest, but to whom? To the moon. So the poet says the sea bears her bosom to the moon. It is very clear that there is a reference of the deep intimacy that has been existing between the sea and the moon for years. The speaker describes this sea as something that should move us, but doesn't. He compares the sea to someone taking off their shirt, which means bears her bosom. Note that he doesn't use like or as. This is a metaphor, therefore. Line number six. The winds that will be hauling at all hours. Friends, have you heard of the term called Aeolian sound or Aeolian tones? Now, this is a sound produced when the wind blows over objects and causes friction. This friction produces sound waves which travel through the air and can make a range of sounds. For example, 
wind encountering moving objects such as leaves can produce irregular sounds. Now this is the very reference taken by the poet in this line when he says winds howling. Normally which animal howls? They are the wolves. But here winds are said to be howling. So being a nature lover, he observes how beautifully the winds are flowing. And that too, it is there round the clock. So if we combine line number 5 and 6, the poet says, we have an enormous and a magnificent sea and right on top of the beautiful sea is the moon, which is having a deep intimacy which is controlling the sea somehow and to add icing to the cake, there are winds blowing constantly. These three natural entities itself are enough to make one feel blissful or mindful or one with the nature. But the poet says, who has time for all that when people are drowned into getting and spending? Society will see how their actions will have consequence which could affect nature and the world. Line number seven, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. To upgather means to gather up. Who are upgathered? In this scenario, it is the moon, the sea and winds. How are they gathered? Just like flowers which are sleeping. So do flowers sleep? Biologically, yes. But here the context is different. The people that Wordsworth is observing, he has referred to them here. Because the moon, the sea and the winds are as good as asleep for those people who are busy in spending and getting and earning money and being in that rat race. Because those people do not have any significance for them. If a man noticed them, he would definitely feel some level of bliss. In which case, he would call them alive. But as the three powerful natural elements are being disregarded by a person drowned into industrialism, they are as good as sleeping for him. So the poet elaborates on a man's alienation from nature, claiming that humanity is no longer susceptible to the influence of the sea, the winds and basically everything else in nature. The speaker describes the beauties of the nature that most people are missing out on. The poet has used personification at several places in the poem as I already stated earlier, such as sea that bears her blossom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours and sleeping flowers. Now friends, I have been referring to this uh, sonnet as a poem, but this is a sonnet. And if you read about sonnet, it has a long history and uh, there is a specific structure as we discussed earlier. So keep in mind that this is actually a sonnet, even when I say in this poem. Line number eight. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. For this means for the three natural entities, the moon, the sea, and for the winds. And for the fact that there is a beautiful scene, there is a natural sighting. So that natural sighting is referred to as this. So the poet says, for this, for everything, we are out of tune. So not only for these things, but for everything else in nature, we are out of tune. Now out of tune here means not in line with nature. It really means that we are doing things which are ruining mother nature. Human actions should be such that we protect the nature and natural elements even more. But here the poet has observed that human actions are completely opposite of what they should be. Our true goal should be to appreciate nature. The speaker uses musical instrument as a metaphor for humanity. For humanity to be out of tune means they are tuned to a pitch that is not in harmony or unison with nature. They are tuned to a pitch which is incorrect. Line number 9. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be. And then comes the next lines. But let's understand this piece of the poem. It moves us not, great God, I'd rather be. Now, it moves us not is a deep statement. 
something moves us only if we feel something for it deep within spending time in nature has been found to help with mental health problems such as anxiety depression for example research into ecotherapy which is a type of a formal treatment which involves doing activities outside in nature has shown that it can help with mild to moderate depression from a stroll through a city park to a day spent hiking in wilderness exposure to nature has been linked to a host of benefits including improved attention lower stress better mood reduced risk of psychiatric disorders and even upticks in empathy and cooperation so here the poet says let there be sea let there be moon let there be wind humans in his time are not moved by this beautiful things which has a host of benefits so he says great god which is the form of sigh or sadness because what he thinks is in a world where people can't even feel the magnificence of nature he just don't want to exist in fact he want to be somewhere else line number 10 a pig suckled in a creed out worn a pig in suckled in a creed out worn friends it becomes interesting from here onwards so there are a lot of words we sh- should learn here first one is pagan pagan what i mentioned here is faithless i've tried to keep it short but the actual meaning is different suckled means breastfed but in uh, the context of the poem it is brought up creed means faith outworn means wear out so let's understand the deeper meaning of this line a pagan suckled in creed outworn means that the people from earlier civilization were pagans raised or we can say suckled or we can say brought up in families who had primitive religious beliefs they were uncivilized they were ignorant their beliefs are now outworn or outdated a pagan suckled in creed outworn means that he wants to have been born to a pagan family who believes in archaic gods which means creed outworn if you describe a belief or custom as outworn you mean that it is old fashioned and no longer has any meaning or usefulness he declares that he would rather be a pagan even though he views that pagan beliefs are outdated there is a term called paganism which refers to polytheistic beliefs now friends what is polytheist there is also a term called monotheist so polytheist means people who believe in more than one god so here in the context of the poem pagans were the same people these were the people who used to believe in more than one gods hence they had polytheistic beliefs now these involve celestial beings acting as gods to different aspects of nature whether it is sun sea sky etc pagans were the people of southern europe they were not worshipers of a monotheistic god they were rustic or rural folks now why has wordsworth mentioned this line wordsworth admires that tradition and perceives that to be close to nature and so he wants them to be one of them he wishes to feed on and relish the mesmerizing beauty of nature as i said earlier paganism is a term first used in the 4th century by early christians and for the people in roman empire who practiced polytheism or ethnic religions other than judaism now i don't want to get into social science but I wanted to give you a background on what a pagan is so that you understand this line very well. So if you read the line earlier it says it moves us not great god I'd rather be a pagan suckle in a creed out want. What he mentions here is rather than being born as a christian or whichever religion he followed in his times he would rather be born as a pagan who is very close to nature and let their beliefs be outworn but still he wants to be one of them so might i standing on this pleasant lee line number 11 the 
the speaker explains why he would rather be born as a pagan. If he were, then he could look at the land in front of him and see something that would not make him feel so lonely and sad, which is called forlorn, which is mentioned in the next line. A lee is a meadow or an open grassland. This is a poetic word used by several poets in the past. It is a meadow or a field. It is a land that has been sown with grass seed. Because he himself is a nature lover, he calls a garden or a field as something that can give him pleasure. A lee is a very pleasant thing for him, for the poet. So he want to be rather be born as a pagan and he want to stand in the middle of a happy garden rather than being born as a human being in an era where people are stuck into a weird rat race. Line number 12. Have glimpses that would make me feel less forlorn. What is a glimpse? Glimpse is a short sight. So let's rephrase this sentence. Have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. The poet wants to have sights of things going on in the meadow that would make him feel less lonely as compared to what he is feeling right now. Now friends, I would like to give you a little more background on pagans. Because if you understand what they used to do as a part of their rituals, this line would be clear. So pagan rituals commonly focus on honoring deity or deities, observing natural cycles such as seasonal changes or the waxing and waning of the moon or celebrating rites of passage such as birth, transitioning into adulthood, marriage and death. Although the form of rituals varies by tradition, pagan rituals tend to engage the participants physically. Rituals often include drumming and chanting and dancing. Some pagans offer food or drink to their gods or ancestors. These offerings may be shared by the participants as a part of a feast or sometimes disposed of ritually. Representations of earth, air, fire and water may also be employed for cleansing and consecration. For instance, participants might anoint themselves with salt water and burn incense as a part of their ritual preparation. Wordsworth knew about pagans. So he want to have the glimpses of countryside and want to taste the rural and rustic life that pagans lived. He would have glimpses of nature that would give him joy and hope or at least make him feel less lonely, less forlorn. Friends, line number 13 and 14 have illusions. Do you know what is an illusion? Illusion is an indirect or direct reference to a person, place, thing or idea of historical, cultural, political or literally of any significance or we can say literary significance. So if there is a reference to a person, place, thing, idea, it is an illusion, especially if it dates back to history. So let's read line number 13. Line number 13. Have a sight of Proteus rising from the sea. So as students, the first question that should arise in your mind is what is Proteus or who is Proteus? And why would he rise from sea? How would he rise from sea? And why as the poet mentioned the reference of Proteus here? So here is the answer. Proteus is an early sea god or god of rivers and oceanic bodies of water. One of the several deities in Greek mythology. Proteus was also known as the old man of the sea. Proteus was generally regarded as a son of the sea god Poseidon. Proteus is known for his ability to shape shift. It is this shape shifting ability of Proteus that led to the English word Protean. So he would convert from a watery shape to a human shape and show himself to the poet which would amuse him as eventually he is a very natural element. He was a sea god or the god of rivers and oceanic bodies of the sea capable of changing his form but the funny part is only when somebody 
goes against his wish so for example if somebody grabbed or on a somebody grabbed a hold of him and tried to make him predict the future he would change his shape and try to run away or get away so the poet says rather than living in an era of industrial revolution he want to be a pagan where he sees proteus rising from the sea this scene would amuse him more than what he was living in his times line number 14 and this is the final line or hear old triton blow his wreathed horn so the question is who is triton and why is he having a horn and why would he blow his horn so friends triton is a greek god of the sea the son of poseidon and amphitrite god and goddess of the sea respectively so you must have heard of mermaids triton is a merman a demigod of the sea so let's go back to greek mythology a little bit according to greek mythology triton dwelt with his parents in a golden palace in the depths of the sea sometimes he was not particularized but was one of the many tritons he was represented as human down to his waist with a tail of a fish which is nothing but a merman triton's special attributes and friends you should focus here triton's special attribute was a twisted seashell on which he blew to calm or raise the waves triton was described as having a conch shell which he blew like a trumpet in short wordsworth would be happy to see the demigod of sea blowing a conch shell just like a trumpet rather than being born in an era of industrial revolution so the poet is actually trying to accentuate the power in nature that people have forgotten but that he wants to be at one with it's time for a quick recap now line number 1 the world is too much with us late and soon means we have become a burden to nature line number 2 getting and spending we lay waste our powers means our human skills are wasted in wanting materialistic things line number 3 little we see in nature that is ours means we feel nature is an alien to us line number 4 we have given our hearts away a sordid boon meaning we are dedicated to something that is shameful Line number five: the sea that bears her bosom to the moon, which means the sight of the beautiful sea and moon. Line number six: the winds that will be howling at all hours, means and the soothing breeze flowing all the time. Line number seven: and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers, which means nature is right here for us to experience. Line number eight: for this, for everything, we are out of tune. which means but humans have lost connection with nature line number 9 it moves us not great god i'd rather be which means no amount of natural beauty affects us line number 10 a pagan suckled in greed outworn which means i'd rather be born as a superstitious under civilized nature believer person line number 11 so might i standing on this pleasantly meaning so that i can feel the happy garden line number 12 have glimpses that would make me feel less forlorn or make me less forlorn meaning and be in the company of nature who will banish my loneliness line number 13 have sight of proteus rising from the sea means experience the tides and ebbs the rising and falling of the sea line number 14 or hear old triton blow his wreathed horn which means or hear and feel the sounds made by the sea and hence mother nature so friends by this we come to an end of this sonnet i hope you've understood it very well if you still have doubts feel free to put those in the comment section and i will try to address your questions if you have any other topic or article or essay or chapter that you don't understand and if you want me to do a video explanation of those 
please mention the name of those in the comment section and I will be more than happy to help you. I hope you have a wonderful day and thank you for watching.